Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar by Core Recruitment. Core has been doing a series of webinars through these very strange and challenging times. We've done about 90 of them so far, all of which are available to be downloaded at www.corerecruitment.com. At Core itself, we've seen a big improvement in business, especially in the past couple of weeks. Through the pandemic, we saw business levels being pretty consistent on the finance, HR and marketing side of things. But in the past couple of weeks, we've seen an increased volume of uh, vacancies at country management, operations and general management positions as well that we hopefully are seeing as being kind of like a really positive sign that the market is starting to return. So that's good. Uh, back to our non-exec and chairman webinar today, we've got a brilliant lineup of speakers. And um, if you want to get in touch and um, post any questions through to us, then please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the uh, comments box to the side of your screen as well. And then we'll try and get through as many of them as possible as we work our way through the webinar. Um, the speakers are gonna give a little bit about themselves and their backgrounds before they answer the first question, which is how their businesses have innovated through the crisis. So Simon, I'm just gonna to come to you first. If you can give a little bit in your background and then answer the first question, please. Thanks, Christian. And, uh... Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, today's webinar. Today's webinar. So my name is Simon Wikes. I've spent 30 years in the leisure sector predominantly, uh, from trainee manager to CEO. I'm currently in my last month with GameSys, which is a FTSE 250 1 billion online gaming operator. And I'm a non-exec director at Wexel Gaming, which is a fast growing digital gaming solution supplier to the leisure industry. Uh, interesting challenges in terms of COVID actually. So uh, for GameSys, COVID wasn't a serious problem on revenue. The actual fact revenue has gone up because channel shift has accelerated over the course of the epidemic. The challenge at GameSys was really to establish remote working for an operation that's largely online, uh, ensure that there were additional responsible gambling measures there to make sure that uh, there wouldn't be any bad or any further negativity caused by that. And also GameSys has a very unique corporate culture. So I think they've been very innovative in the way that they've ensured that staff remain engaged other than just doing the jobs. I mean, everyone's talked about productivity and what home working does to that, which seems to be largely unchanged if slightly positive. But there is a real danger that your corporate culture and the way you do things gets impacted. And I think GameSys have worked really hard on making sure that uh, employees stay engaged. The second organisation I was in was Wexel Gaming, did have the challenges with income because it largely supplied leisure venues which weren't around. Uh, but had a very, very strong balance sheet and a, a low cost base, which was largely covered by the furlough scheme. So again, where I think Wexel have really uh, focused on is about thinking about taking this time to think about where can the business go? So a real deep review of the strategy of the business, what are the different markets, what can be learned from COVID and applied differently, but also using that time to invest in extra training. So, you know, even things like LinkedIn learning and all of those areas, really trying to use this opportunity of free time to upskill everyone within the workforce so that when everyone returns back to normal, they're in a much stronger position to move forward going forward. Excellent. And Simon, you, where we first kind of met was obviously when, was when you were working with Gala. Um, I mean, in terms of that type of, or that style of business, what do you think the future is going to look like on the bingo side of things? Not in terms of online, but in terms of actual physical, you know, clubs. Uh, I think the physical clubs are going to be, uh, it's going to be challenging because you've got a, a large customer base um, and the whole issue with the retail uh, bingo business at the moment is the existing venues are too large for what's required now. Uh, there's a, and there's a real, as I think you find in all leisure businesses, you know, one of the big challenges is you tend to have two groups of customers, regular customers and, and irregular customers. Uh, Bingo is unique in that that core group of core customers generate a significant proportion of revenue, uh, but you get all the new customers coming in and they provide the majority but don't drive as much revenue. Now, if you compare it to something like Tempin Bowling, for example, they are very small hardcore customers but don't generate as much revenue as the more leisure consumers. And it's about, therefore, driving change when you've got customers who are very established in their ways is challenging. Uh, the way that that business will evolve over time is uh, increasing, you know, what are customers looking for? They're looking for flexibility, convenience and simplicity. And I think uh, digital mediums will continue to provide that. They'll be about how uh, 
operators can persuade customers to embrace change in the way that the products and services are delivered to them. So definitely uh, opportunities in that space because there's still a hell of a lot of uh, people wanting to experience uh, bingo in a retail setting or, or casinos in a casino setting or betting in a bookmaker setting. But uh, got to have a change about the way that dynamic works going forward. And I think technology will be the answer to that. Yeah, we'll come on to that in a minute. Thank you very much, Simon. Thanks for being with us. Jim, on to you. I left myself on mute, which is probably not the only time I'll do that this afternoon. <laughs> I'm Jim Waite. I run uh, Waite Partners, also known as WPC, a small private equity firm. Uh, I'm here, or Christian invited me along because we own Riley's, which is uh, still the UK's leader, leader in Q Sports and darts. Um, I usually find this kind of audience that quite a lot of people have actually uh, been in Riley's uh, venues over, over the years, been around for uh, in some shape or form for about 100 years or so. Um, ledger is not all we do. Uh, we also um, have an investment in uh, an elderly mental health business, which means we've had a, an interesting pandemic. You'll have read a lot, a lot about that kind of things in the newspapers, although our business has done surprisingly well. And we also have businesses which have been pretty much unaffected by um, COVID. So, the specifics about uh, Riley's and, and um, COVID lockdown, the world we now live in, uh, it, it was shut for, for five months, like a, a, a lot of businesses, longer than, longer than many. Uh, it reopened yesterday, um, or I should say really a soft reopening, and then it will sort of, um, and once we're conf confident that operations are working right, then we'll, we'll give it a push at some point over the next week or so. Um, um, Krishna asked me the question, what have we done uh, to innovate through the crisis? Um, we've, I'm not quite sure it counts as, as innovation, but a lot of businesses, common sense really. Uh, we've taken the opportunity to uh, do some defensive restructuring. The business has been through administration and we're opening up uh, with slightly fewer, fewer, fewer slight sites than we uh, went into lockdown with, um, and also with a, a slimmed down HQ. Um, but at the same time, we've, we've done some things with technology. We'd already done a lot with technology and we did a bit more uh, in our, um, our, our five months when we had a bit more time to think. And, and we've done a lot with pricing. Um, our pricing was, was, was a bit complicated, a bit hard for consumers to understand. And therefore, we weren't convinced that um, they really knew when and where they were getting value for money. Uh, we did a lot of preparatory work. Um, end of last year and early this year and um, uh, the gap gave us the opportunity to really really think that through and, and get that properly launched as part of part of the reopening process. Excellent Jim thank you very much for being with us. Just sticking with the care side of things because I think that's a it's been a very emotive issue kind of like obviously through the kind of pandemic could you give us a little bit about that business and how you've been supporting them through this time? So, so our business is um, slightly different to, well, it is, it is different to the, the average um, care home. Uh, we deal with people who, um, who have a genuine men mental illness as opposed to ordinary, ordinary dementia. So they're, they're sort of halfway between a, a, a care home and a hospital, almost. Um, and um, so it's a very clinically in, in, uh, focused environment. Uh, by contrast, uh, 10, 15 years ago, I was uh, the CFO of a group that, and uh, as well as the largest mental health provider, the, the priory hospitals, it also owned the, the, the number two uh, provider of, uh, of care homes back then. And fairly typically of, of, of care homes, whilst they're you know, obviously there to, to care for people, um, there is quite a large emphasis on making sure that people uh, the residents really get a fulfilling last couple of years of their life and so there's a lot of emphasis on things like hoteling and food and, um, and, and, and the less clinical aspects of running, running care homes. Um, and I think the, the thing that was fortunate for us is that clinical focus, albeit a mental health clinical focus, carried through into um, um, a strong focus on, uh, on infection control. Um, and so whilst we did have cases of COVID in all of the homes, uh, we controlled those cases and, and as a result, we're at a similar level of occupancy in our, 
our homes as we were uh, before the crisis. Um, whereas the, the, the general industry statistics are that occupancy rates have gone from um, high 80s percent to high 70s percent. Now, I know and some of the hoteliers listening to that would, would kill for high 70 percent occupancy, but uh, in the care home world, in regular care homes, that, that is on the border of loss making. Oh. And, and just last question on the care side of things, Jim, because I don't want to get too sidetracked on it, but there has been kind of like, you know, some talk about, you know, longer term mental health issues and, and kind of like, you know, especially kind of like around kind of like, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome and all of that side of things for the employees working within those environments. Uh, just for those who might not be familiar with that, could you just give us a little bit of a flavour of, of, of how that's been evolving through the business? Yeah, the... I'm probably a little bit of a uh, preamble to sort of for people, many of you will have been in care homes. I expect almost nobody has worked in a care home. Um, and as a visitor to a loved one in the care home, those of you who've experienced it will be, um, will know that it's exactly that. It's a visit, it's a visit to a loved one. The people who work in care homes, um, just like the people who work in hospitality, are attracted to hospitality because they want to be hospitable. Um, the people who work in care homes, uh, almost without exception, work in care homes because they care. Um, and so surprisingly quickly they develop similar sorts of bonds to the, uh, the people that they look after that, um, that those residents' loved ones will have with those people. Um, so you know, Realistically, it's a, it's a fairly regular occurrence in a care home, care home that someone uh, passes away. I don't know anyone, including people who've worked in care homes for 30, 40 years, who doesn't find that a traumatic experience if it happens yeah. in a home, that, a home that they're running. So, so that's a general context of wearing, working in care homes. Um, what happened during the lockdown is firstly, stress levels went through the ceiling because you had this threat against, um, uh, against the residents, number one, uh, against the carers, number two, um, of, of infection. And don't forget, the carers very worried that they would be the people who infected uh, the people that they had a, um, a deep-rooted um, desire to care for. So you, you're walking into work with this contradiction in your mind, am I the carer or am I the, the, the carrier of, 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 of the virus? Um, so, um, so a real sort of massive increase in stress levels. And, and then on top of that, um, an increase in death rates. Um, so it really was a very difficult time for people. Um, now, as I to given what we do, um, uh, as, as our sites, if they don't have an on, on site psych, psychologist, it's because that's a vacancy. Um, so our sites have a multidisciplinary team, which in, fortunately includes, includes local psychology support, and that's usually directed uh, at the residents and at their families. We doubled that and directed it at the staff as well, um, as well as bringing in outside, outside services and. Um, uh, you know, that was one of several things which we did to try and support the staff through what was just an incredibly difficult time for them. Um, I don't know of cases within our 300 employees of people who have post-traumatic stress. Uh, I do know that the support we gave our, our, um, our employees because of the nature of our, uh, our sites is different to what you would get in a normal care home. Um, and, and if you didn't have that level of support, you know, I think it's quite believable that people will have uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, not, not, and not just in care homes, in hospitals as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Jim. Sorry for the side track. I just think it's such an interesting corner of the marketplace and also which had uh, rather misunderstood media coverage in the past five months. So it's, it's always good to, to take any opportunity to if talk about it. If you get me onto that, then I will talk for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Although not in a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Thank you very much for being with us, Jim. Much appreciated. Ian, on to you. Well, uh, first I'd like to say, Jim, thank you for that, because that, that's pretty humbling. Uh, I mean, you know, we 
obviously in the legislature thing that our concerns are the biggest and the you know the, the hardest and all the rest of it but i mean that really does put it in perspective so um i'm ian edwards uh, i'm very lucky that uh, having started life as an investment banker i spent probably most of the last 30 years in and around the legislature sector as an advisor, uh, as an investor, and uh, as a non-exec on the board of, I think, 12 different leisure businesses, ranging from pubs, bars, restaurants, through to um, tempin bowling machines and uh, various other parts of the sector. So I've been lucky enough to see a lot of it from various different uh, perspectives. I think, um, you know, at the moment, I'm a, I'm a co-founder of Hippo Inns with Rupert Cleveley and Enterprise Inns. We're the first managed expert, which was the Enterprise Inns uh, new strategy uh, about five or six years ago. Um, I'm a co-founding investor in Pizza Pilgrims and Thunderbird Fried Chicken, both of which I think have got fabulous products. So if you haven't tried them, please do. Um, and unfortunately, I was a, a, a non-exec of Seafood Pub Company, which um, despite being a very interesting and very attractive um, product, I'm afraid hasn't made the journey through uh, the COVID crisis, and I'm afraid we're, you know, we're going through an administration process at the moment. So I've seen over the last six months everything from, you know, that sort of really tough experience where unfortunately we've left uh, a number of our employees, you know, out of work, which is really, really distressing, through to uh, pizza pilgrims who have pivoted so extraordinarily that they've ended up being the first business that Rishi and Boris went to visit. Uh, when they went down to Canary Wharf. Um, the boys have been fantastic. I, I mean, there's a business that is, um, I think, serving phenomenal, genuine Neapolitan pizzas uh, out of uh, a dozen or so different sites. Um, and through COVID, once we'd um, put everybody on furlough and closed the business down, uh, the boys uh, then started developing pizza kits. And it ended up that having stuck 50 pizza kits on the website to see how they'd go, and they went in 30 seconds. Um, the business is doing somewhere around 1,000 kits a day. Uh, it's 20 pounds a kit. It comes to your door from um, DPD, deliver it. Uh, you get two pots of fresh dough, uh, along with all the gubbins you need to make a pizza. And it's a sensationally good pizza. It's a lot of fun to do. And obviously, it was a lot of fun for a lot of families to do while they were locked at home and rather than arguing with each other they were making food together and that was a lot of fun and that worked very well so um from that point of view i'd say they have been a great example of how to um develop a new stream of income in a time of a really a enormous adversity i mean nothing like what jim's talking about completely we've got to put it in perspective nothing like that but in terms of our industry um we are under enormous pressure there's a vast uh, potential for a, a lot of people to be laid off and we're all doing the best we can to try and, and find a way through it. Absolutely and, and tell us about Thunderbird Ian how's that been going? Well I mean Thunderbird's quite difficult in the sense that you know Thunderbird was a, a very new business when we got into um, into the crisis we, um, we, we it was founded by uh, Matt Harris uh, down at um, Dynarama it's a great product. I mean, the chicken is fantastic. I think there's some very good premium fried chicken businesses. I think they're all going through that stage of uh, either being a, a sort of a teenager or being even less than that, a bit of an infant. Uh, and I think everyone's trying to work out quite how you make um, premium fried chicken uh, a genuinely long-term viable proposition. I mean, whatever people may or may not say about KFC, it's a fabulous business. Um, and it has a, a clearly defined niche in the market. I think with premium fried chicken, um, everyone's slightly trying to work their way through what exactly is the, is the sustainable proposition. Um, we've got uh, a number of sites that were embedded sites like, like Dynarama and, and um, the Giant Robot. Standalone sites have been slightly tougher. So we're working our way through it. Uh, we've got good backing from TriSpan, who've been actually amazingly supportive through pre and post COVID. Um, a good example of how to support a business when it's at a relatively embryonic stage. So I turn it up to them. Um, and and uh, we're hopefully on a good journey, but it, we're at a very early stage and it, it's probably too early to tell. I think with Hippo, um, we again are in a situation where uh, EI were taken over by Stonegate Stonegate backed by TDR, again, probably one of the best private equity firms in the business. 
Uh, and we're in a very early stage of discussing how we take that business forward. I mean, I, you know, I think they're a great partner. I'd love to do more with them, but we'll, we'll have to see. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Much appreciated, Ian. Neil, coming on to you. Uh, thank you, Christian. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Neil McLaurin from a gloomy Berkshire on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, 30, crikey, two, three years in hospitality, sport, leisure events, predominantly around the food and beverage space of stadia, arena, conference exhibition centres, uh, etc. Um, started my first business in 1987. Uh, ended up selling that to our dear friends at uh, Compass Group in the early 2000s. Uh, went on a bit of a magical mystery tour across different functions within Compass Group, but predominantly around their sport and leisure business uh, with some quite interesting developments, uh, mobilising the O2 Arena in 2007, believe it or not, uh, doing some joint ventures with the Rugby Football Union, Surrey County Cricket Club, whatever. Uh, so I did 10 years of Compass, which was a huge amount of fun, fantastic business. Uh, and then left there and uh, since then I've been working with either investing in or working as non-exec or advisory roles across various functions, uh, be that food and beverage, uh, a couple of food businesses, a contract catering business, two little tech companies, one of which is a late stage uh, startup, uh, one of which uh, um, listed on the New York Stock Exchange and also some, some charity work as well. Uh, and also a little bit in uh, in luxury in gold and silver, so very diverse. Uh, common theme across most of those businesses are they are owner managed businesses, uh, and I think one of the dynamics, and I don't think it's particularly innovative, but a big big focus has been over the last five months or so around communication. And I know communication, you know, is, is a very broad word, but you know whether it's your shareholders, stakeholders, banks, clients and most importantly, your staff, uh, because no one has ever experienced a time like this, which is completely out of everybody's hands. You know, we can look back over financial crises, we can look back over our business careers, and we might have mismanaged things and we blame ourselves. No one is to blame for this. Uh, and very interesting what the guys are saying around mental health. I, you know, I do believe that communicating with your own people through so much uncertainty is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and actually tech and innovation, not just Zoom or Teams, but we've got Yammer, we've got Yapster, we've got all sorts of other tools to make communication with our teams across the different businesses fundamental. And what, what we've seen, as everyone has, you know, with a, with a dreadful backdrop, which is so bad for so many people and so many businesses, some of which will not return, is it's actually given a lot of people, and I've talked mainly about owner managers here, more time to stop, think, pause for breath, consider what we're doing, think strategically, what is our value position, what's going to be happening in a world that is still full of so much uncertainty and miscommunication from government, et cetera, et cetera. But in a, in a very perverse way, I think that as an NED in a lot of those businesses, it's really been fantastic thinking time, pausing for breath, and how can we position ourselves in this, this new world, as they say, still so many unknowns. So I know that's not particularly innovative, um, Krishnan, but I think, you know, communicating and really focusing on communication has been fundamental across the businesses that I'm involved with. Absolutely. And Ian, uh, with the majority of the businesses you're involved in being entrepreneur led, I mean, how from our, I mean, a mental health from our, um, uh, sorry, Neil, um, from, a, from a mental health perspective from kind of like, you know, um, um, have you been kind of like supporting those guys kind of through this period? Yeah, you know, continually. I think it's very much part of the role that a, an NED should play in, in, in keeping the sort of independent independence of what I believe a non-exec should be doing, whether that's a, a listed business, a, a, a PLC, an owner-managed business. But just to keep sort of I wouldn't even say reinforcing, you know, because a lot of entrepreneurs, owner managers are very headstrong. It's their way or the highway. So you're almost playing devil's advocate to a degree uh, and just, you know, guiding and probing and getting in their ear, really, that this is fundamental because, as I say, no, no one's been through what we've been through the last five, six months or so. You know, people sat at home far less fortunate than ourselves. Very easy to forget what people are going through. And, you know, just asking questions and how are you and how are the family and just being a little bit empathetic, sympathetic and understanding. And it's, you know, they're all overused words, but actually we don't do enough of it in society. 
Uh, and I, as I say, I, I'm, I'm a bit like a broken record, but just keep communicating with your stakeholders and your staff is fundamental. Absolutely. Thank you very much for being with us, Neil. Much appreciated. Now, Simon, coming back to you, and I mean, obviously, with uh, technology has been a major factor for everybody over the past kind of like five months. How do you think we should maximise the change which is kind of coming about? I think it's, uh, I mean, in terms of the uh, market trends on technology, I think you've got to look at each implementation of technology and try and think about it a little bit more holistically. I think one of the big challenges for businesses over the course of the last few years is people get sucked into its growth or margin. And I think the answer is to do both. So I think anyone looking to implement technology, you know, what are you looking to try and do? I think it's the, the holy grail of can you increase sales, improve margins and increase customer satisfaction at the same time. And I think that's possible by using technology to reduce customer service touch points, uh, using it to schedule staff more effectively by trying to think about how the staff can interact. You can start to reduce the costs of that area and also by taking out queuing time, which increases sales. So if you think about that in a beverage setting, in a food and beverage setting, that becomes quite simple. You know, how easy is it to, for people to engage and order uh, food and drinks, register and get all that process through? How can you make that touch point as quickly as possible? Uh, then about how do you organize the, uh, the delivery of the food to table and the taking away of cutlery? And how then can you up, make sure that you try and upsell and get through that, that technology there? So whenever you're looking at implementing technology, how can you actually adapt it and change it to put all three, three, three thing, things in? I mean, I've recently just come back from Spain. Really interesting to see that virtually every restaurant that I went into in Spain bearing in mind in Spain, the smartphone penetration is much lower than in the UK, is using QR codes to do menus. No one's got any menus anymore. They're all using QR codes. That's kind of where their uh, technology ends. So they've saved some money printing menus. Uh, it's relatively easy for the customer to access it, but they haven't thought about how can they bolt other bits on that to improve the overall experience. And I think that's the answer to all of this. Ultimately, how are you gonna get the holy grail of increasing sales, improving margins, and better customer satisfaction. Okay, thank you very much for that, Simon. Jim, coming back to you, and regarding the government support side of things, specifically in this country, what do, do you what do you think that they've done well? What do you think they could improve on? What do you think they can do in the future to safeguard businesses? I um, I think I think they're in a very difficult position. Uh, I, well, firstly, I think it's phenomenal what they have done. I should say, um, because um, yeah, not all of uh, what they've done has been perfectly directed, but they've done so much that I think it, you know, if they hadn't, hadn't put in place the furlough scheme, if, uh, even the eat out to help out of, of, of recent weeks, without those, I think we'd, have, we'd be in a very different place uh, sat here at the, uh, the beginning of September. Uh, I think in an ideal world, I personally would be supportive of a lot of the more targeted schemes that people are talking about, like, um, and I'm sure it's something we'll talk about more later, but um, support for city centre, especially London uh, locations that are being decimated by a lack of commuter traffic. Um, but I, I have some sympathy that there are so many hands out at, at, at the moment for support, um, that, um, and they've already spent a boatload of money, um, that I have some sympathy that um, you know, some of the change that's been forced upon us and uh, they will just have to uh, let it take its course. That might not be the most popular answer to this audience, uh, but I think it's uh, in many ways a, a, a pragmatic one. And I think, as I say, I think we should be grateful that they've got us to where we are today. Absolutely. And Ian, coming back to you, and, and, and I guess kind of like reading on from that a little bit, there is this relationship with landlords which lots of people have been kind of talking about at the moment. Should the government intervene? Should they not intervene? What do you think should happen next? Well, I think the, the obvious area they can help is business race. And, and, and looking at how to restructure business races, it was already something that was on the table and I think should be looked at much more closely. I think when most of us started off in business, uh, business rates was a, was a really, a, a very small amount that, that you were paying. I mean, now you could be paying half your rent in business rates. I mean, that clearly is, is structurally unsound. 
I think with the relationship between landlord and tenant, I mean, it's quite difficult. I'm, I'm sitting in certain situations where I'm on a board of a business where we're a landlord. Most of my businesses were a tenant. I think on the whole, the landlords we've dealt with have, the institutional landlords have generally been pretty sympathetic. Some of the private landlords have been fantastic. And then there's been the odd private landlord who frankly just wants his money or her money and then they're going to do whatever they can to get it. I don't really see that the government can do a vast amount in, in, in that. I think one of the obvious places that I think things should change is we'd all love to see turnover rent. Of course we would, because then the better you are as an operator, the more likely you're going to get taken on. You're going to pay them more rent. So if I take, I go back to Peter Pilgrim's, in Kingly Court, we pay a lot of rent. We make a lot of money. It's a fantastic symbiotic relationship, aren't we lovely? And that's great. Um, but, you know, that's an exceptional situation. In most situations, it's much more nuanced and much more complicated. So I think for the government to get too involved in that, I think it's very, very difficult. I mean, I completely agree with what Jim said earlier. I, I mean, it's so easy to criticise. It's so easy to sit on the sidelines and say they should do this or they should do that. Um, you know, we were talking up countries like France and Germany about how good they were. And now, look, you know, they're going back in the same way. So this, we won't know for 10 years who really did the best job on this thing. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a zero-sum game sort of throwing bricks around. Uh, in terms of, of where we go with the landlords, I mean, I think you're going to see that in the same way that certain leasehold assets go through CVAs, prepacks, whatever it may be, some disappear. I think you're going to get the same situation with landlords you've seen already, you know, into under pressure. And I think that's going to continue. Where, where I suppose we'd all like to be is turnover rent. I think the other thing that they could do is get rid of the upward only rent reviews. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. It's completely um, counter competitive. There's no other situation I can think of where a product's value and price can only go either the same or up. It just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't happen in almost any other, other part of the world. So that to me seems a very curious thing that really should be, should be got rid of. And I think also the using, you know, the latest example of some, potentially idiotic person who's come in and paid a hell of a lot of rent as the benchmark to set further rents doesn't make much sense either. I, so I, I think there's a lot that could be done. I think in the businesses I'm involved in, where we're, we're involved with good landlords, I think um, there's an opportunity to do much more with them. I think you may well end up in a situation where certain very, very long-termist landlords may say, you know, we can actually do some of the investment for you. Um, maybe we'll take a stake. I think nothing is off the table. I think some of the, the really good landlords may end up saying, actually, you know, if we invest behind some of these businesses, it could be really interesting for us as a, a way of taking our own business forward while we're in a world that is not quite as black and white as it used to be, where we just basically built it and they came. So I think there's lots of possibilities here, but it's difficult. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Ian. Good suggestions. Um, Neil, coming back to you, in, in the 2008 uh, recession, the market kind of polarized quite a bit where you kind of had kind of like people traded up to luxury if they had lots of money and they still had lots of money or they traded down towards value. Are you seeing any trends in that area and in, in your businesses or are you potentially looking at any future things that you're looking to get involved with along either line? Yeah, Christian, I think it's a really uh, good, good question. And I think I'll always go back to what goes on on the high street and let's look at grocery retail and let's look at the Aldi and little effects on the high streets and let's see what Waitrose were doing. Some of the questions still are M&S food are doing and when M where M&S food are going and the specialists and then you look at the mid market which is still about 80% of the market if not a little bit more at the moment fighting for their value proposition what they mean their position where are they? And I think you can take that analogy and you can put it into airlines. You look at first class, you look at premium economy, you look at economy. You know, the reality is the mid market is the biggest market. And uh, that's where I think everyone gets a little bit muddled. And I'm a great believer in doing what you do, committing to it and, and sticking by it. And whether that's the, the, the top end or the, or the value added proposition at the bottom, the reality is I think there is there is a space for it all. But you do see in the whole washing machine of the cycle, those that get started, stuck in the mid-market can often lose sight of who they are and what they're trying to be. Uh, so it, it's, I, I don't have an answer and it's up to each business to decide what marketplace they want to go and play in. But, uh, you know, even through very, very tough times, and let's face it, you know, the global economy is going to be pretty horrific for uh, maybe the rest of our lifetimes. 
but there is still a hell of a lot of money in the world uh, and people are still trading up. But there is an awful lot of people that will have to sadly have to trade down and there will be a market, and I have no doubt a growing market for the more entry point propositions. But where, where I think you get confusion in, in most industries is those battling for the mid markets and really losing identity as to what they are. And I think going back to the grocery retail analogy, you know, funnily enough, Tesco are coming out of this for a price war uh, and their volume in the UK and they're going to be taking on the German discount retailers. And let's see what that actually means. Um, whereas the, the guys at the other end, M&S Food, actually doing pretty well uh, and now have made announcements that they're going to be doing more around food only stores, but they will focus on the top end. So I think, you know, you, you have to decide what area you want to go and play in. Uh, but I certainly see the top end thriving and I see the entry point thriving and that whole mid market, I think, will get squeezed and probably come down, depending on sector, to maybe about 60 percent of the market. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, in terms of the, the businesses that you support, I mean, Bartlett Mitchell's obviously on the, the food service side of things. Are, are there other food retail businesses you're also involved in? Uh, I'm, I'm in a food production business, so similar to Pizza Pilgrims, although we don't own our own sites, a business called Barrel and Stone, uh, which is similar to uh, what Ian was saying, everything was going swimmingly until about the 22nd or 23rd of March, and then every single one of our clients closed, whether that was a pub group, a hotel, a restaurant, a bar, a casino, a club, literally went overnight, and thrilled to hear what Ian's saying, and you know, putting positive spins on a pretty dire situation. The boys there grabbed it and launched a direct-to-consumer business. We had absolutely no experience in that marketplace at all. And as we all know, when you're dealing directly with the consumer, that creates its own issues. And the boys, I think, since of some, about 75,000 pizza kits have been delivered to people's home, spending 150 quid on Facebook marketing and just rolling his sleeves up and giving it a go. Uh, and that, you know, that for me, is, as, as say Ian's mentioned it, is is one of the great stories being driven by this awful environment we find ourselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and coming out of the other side of this, specifically for Barrel and Stone, as you know, companies look to diversify their revenue streams and all of that kind of stuff, do you think that could be an opportunity for them? Well, what we're seeing, uh, Krishnan, over the last sort of three, four weeks uh, uh, or so ago is that if you look at your average pub, bar, restaurant, and because of all the restrictions and you know two meters down to one meter and what that means for back of house staffs and chefs and your your rosters for your front of house staff we have seen a lot of restaurants and bars do a more restricted menu uh, and that actually has worked in our favor because our pizzas are delivered into a, a bar or restaurant they're pre-assembled the dough is pre-rolled and you you are sorry they're not pre-assembled the dough is pre-rolled you put your toppings on you cook it and you serve it so it's very simple it's very easy you don't need a qualified chef to stretch dough, make dough, anything else at all. So it actually has ticked an awful lot of boxes over the last months or so uh, as the on trade has started to remobilize. And, uh, you know, long may that continue for, for Barrel and Stone as a business. Uh, but yeah, a very, uh, very interesting dynamic. And uh, as, as Ian will also know, pizza, uh, don't tell our customers, but it's a reasonable margin business. Oh, no, no, no. Very small, very small, <laughs> really. <Oof>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should be stroking a weight cat. Thank you very great much value. for that. <laughs> great value. Absolutely. Great value. <laughs> great. Thank you very much for that, Neil. Now, Simon, coming back to you, and um, what advice would you give entrepreneurs regarding uh, sales versus margins at the moment? Uh, as I said, I, I think one of the most important things for, for everyone to do now is to uh, to make sure that they look at everything and try and go for both. You know, I've seen a lot of organisations uh, chase sales and uh, organisations have been in that position are now in a difficult place because the sales have evaporated, they've got a too big a cost base, then they have to take very draconian actions. So I think particularly, you know, COVID is, is a huge amount of pain, but it's the steps that businesses will take coming outside of COVID that will be determine success or not. So I was in the kind of retail bingo sector at the time of smoking ban, uh, Northern Rock, uh, and the new gambling act all hit in the same month. And I think we had 120 units at the time and a hundred of them went loss making uh, in a day. And uh, that causes you to really re-examine how your business works. And that's when we really started thinking about like, how can we grow sales? 
How can we do it at the lowest possible margin? And how can we actually do all that and improve customer service at the same time? And that takes some really hard thinking because it means you don't just land on the easy answers. You have to do a bit more work than that. But when you do get it, it really works. And I then, you know, I've been into other organizations within the same sector at the same time, uh, never really truly recovered because they shot themselves in the foot on the actions they took uh, to those issues. So I would be advising every small business now is Corona's a one-off thing. There was nothing you could do about it. It's happened. If you're going to be successful now, it's about thinking about how can you improve sales, improve service, and do that at the best possible margin at the same time. And make sure that, it's your, that your responses to COVID isn't what kills you now, if you get, got through this way. So it is, it is possible to do, because I've seen so many organizations do it, but you've got to be really, really hard, and there's no time for lazy thinking. You've really got to think things through and keep asking yourself how you can get all three that you go for sales margin and service at the same time. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Simon. Jim, coming back to you, if there's one positive that I'm taking away from um, COVID currently, it's that we've had four months of media without much mention of Brexit. It is starting to resurface on the table just now. What advice are you giving to your businesses? What steps should take should people take? I mean, I mean, in the light of COVID, I mean, it, it doesn't really seem to matter as much as it did last year. Am I right in saying that? And it's you know exactly that. I think in the light of COVID, it matters less. <clears throat> I think um, you know certainly um, the worries that there were in the in the lower paid sectors like hospitality, retail, and um, and health and social care. Uh, about shortages of employees. I don't think people are worrying about shortages of employees in quite the same way um, yeah. that they were when uh, Brexit talk was on. Um, I don't think the, uh, you know, there were fear, fears around inflationary increases. I think people are less worried about those. Generally speaking, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, than, than they were. Um, I think probably the, the bigger worry is whether uh, and this depends on which side of the fence you fall. Uh, but uh, those who believe that Brexit's a bad thing see, you know, recessionary pressures from COVID with recessionary pressures from uh, Brexit layered on. Those who sit on the other side of the fence see recessionary pressures from COVID being saved uh, by the UK being able to take control of its destiny and have a sort of mini economic boom as a, as a result to compensate for, for, for COVID. Um, but I think, you know, I think, I think, I think rightly, as you say, the, the, the general talk is if it's much less of an issue in the wider scheme of things than it, it previously was. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Jim. Much appreciated. Ian, coming back to you, and in terms of the opportunities coming up for the future on the kind of other side of this, what do you think people should be looking out for? Do you see any opportunities for yourself coming up on the other side of this? Yeah, I mean, look, the way, I, the way I look at it, um, as a private investor, um, I, I think you keep your powder dry until at least next March. I think none of us really know how the end of furlough, how the end of the, the, the landlord moratorium, how the consumer will come back from all of this in the autumn. And none of us know how any of that's going to play out. It's really, really complicated. And, and I think if you, if you don't have to invest right now, Maybe you sit on the sidelines and, and watch and try and, and talk to the businesses that you'd like to invest in. And I'm interested to talk to anybody who thinks at the end of this that they're going to come out with a business that they want to grow and they want to get enthusiastic about. Because I think there's no question that the leisure sector is going to thrive at the end of this in some way, shape or form. We're all going to spend yeah. money out there. We are in a great sector. Yes, at the moment it looks terrible. I mean, the, the comments about Brexit are quite funny because people who are at the extreme ends of Brexit, pro or anti, telling us that the world was going to end come the end of, of, of this year, look pretty stupid because actually the world ended kind of thing when COVID came along and it was so much more dramatic than anything that will happen out of Brexit that I think they look a little bit silly. But that aside, um, I, I'm, you know, I, when I look at the sort of things that, that, that I've invested in that have gone well, um, generally speaking, there, there are things that you look for and the people you back and obviously these things like resilience and hard work, determination, originality, all these sort of things are very important. Character is massive. I think um, people who've shown the sort of character, again, you know, I'll come back to Pilgrims and I think Geronimo, uh, um, uh, Hippo has done a lot of this as well. People who've shown great character in the way they've, they've held their head up and, and 
looked after, as, as Neil rightly said, communicated with all the constituents of their business through this are the sort of people you admire and who you really want to get involved with at the other end of it. Exactly when that will be, it's very difficult to tell. Christmas looks, looks like it's, in the, in the industries where Christmas is a two or three month business out of their year, I think they've got real problems. It's a real nightmare because they're not going to get it this year. January and February is often very, very tough for a lot of us in a lot of our businesses. So I think given that we don't know where we are on a vaccine, given we don't know where, really where we are in consumer demand, um, it's going to be very difficult to tell what you should or shouldn't do, I think, until sort of the end of the first quarter of the next year. But then there will be fantastic opportunities. I think in the businesses that, that we've got that are going really well, we are trying to get ourselves as financially strong as we can now because I think there are going to be some fantastic, there are already some amazing site opportunities coming through. There will be great opportunities to grab fantastic people for our businesses. So I'm really positive from that perspective. Um, I'm slightly worried about the eat out to dine out, if I'm honest. It was a wonderful shot in the arm, but we've got to be very, very wary of going down, particularly say casual dining, which should have learned its lesson from what happened last time, going down too much for the discounting route. I mean, eat out to dine out has been fantastic. It's a shot in the arm, but let's be honest, it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, massive discounting process. And if you come out of the end of this, uh, we've got to be very careful about how discounting does or doesn't play in our sector. Yeah. It's the sort of knee jerk reaction that a lot of people did when their businesses were under pressure. And it was catastrophic, particularly to the mid market. And as Neil rightly says, if you don't know where you are in the mid market, I think you've gone. I think in the casual dining world, if you haven't got a clear proposition, a good value proposition, and you haven't got a strong relationship with your consumers, I think you've gone. I just don't think charging people three times what you've paid for something, sort of 75% gross margin for an ordinary product in the mid-market. I don't think that works. And thank you very much for that, Ian. And just a quick side question, because you may be the only person who may be able to explain this to me, but what has the government got against 10-pin bowling? And why is that kind of like, you know, been, been so heavily uh, penalised um, in the last kind of a couple of months? Because they're letting people, they're letting 400 people get in an easy jet flight. Why can't you go bowling? There are questions, Christian, that are beyond my pay grade. I, I have to tell you, I, I am struggling with that. I mean, I, mean I, you know, I was very involved in, in bowling, and two of the guys who are chairman of the two biggest companies are people I've known very well and done business with over the years, and they are tearing their hair out. It's a really tough one. I mean, you know, you've rightly picked a, 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 what looks like a strange anomaly that's difficult to get your head around. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I, I haven't really got enough detail about, about why they've come up with that decision. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, I, I do think, by the way, in the long term, I think Hollywood and Tempin will be fine. I think they're good yeah. businesses. And I think actually they're a great example of how technology has dramatically helped businesses which you know, have high focused periods of very, very high margin business. And they've managed to build their shoulders build a much more effective product than, than it was when I was involved in it about 20 years ago. So good for them. But I don't know the answer. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Neil, coming back to you, and I mean, if there's one thing which is for sure, it's the amount of communication, the amount of articles, the amount of email traffic um, that kind of comes through kind of like, you know, our devices kind of on a day-to-day -day basis um, and, you know, through LinkedIn and social media challenge channels and all of this kind of stuff. What advice are you giving your businesses at the moment in terms of cutting through that noise or kind of like, you know, getting their message across? Um, I think, Krishnan, be, be very targeted. Be very clear on your message and be very targeted. I think we're probably all getting a bit, and I hate to say this as well, I think there's a bit, and I sit on the board of a charity, I think there is, there's a bit of charity fatigue at the moment. You know, mm. we are getting inundated with it and we all love the nhs we clapped every thursday evening for 14 15 16 weeks whatever it might have been but i think there's a lot of noise i think you know communication isn't just about lots of it communication is about very well thought through clear messaging to a very specific and targeted audience and i think it was interesting i think it was simon saying about sales and margin and everything else so i also think one of the things certainly in the contract catering world where I still do some work is we've never talked about loyalty in contract catering, never talked about loyalty, which for such a mature sector and such a well-advanced sector, which broadly is, is, is tough right now, 
um, very little conversation around loyalty. And if we think back to some of the great loyalty campaigns, that, you know, I'll go back to Tesco Club Car because it's quite close to my heart, but you know, we, we, we're not good at rewarding our loyal customers. It's a lot easier to keep a customer than it is to go and find a new one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think loyalty will be key in coming out of this. I completely concur about, you know, the um, Eat Out to Help Out campaign finishing on Monday evening. Uh, you know, who some of the pub groups have come out and said they're going to continue it. Um, good luck, I think, probably. But let's see how that one washes through. And I think more broadly, Krishna, and I'm not sort of answering your, your question directly, that I think looking at short, medium and longer term, I'm very much with the businesses I'm involved with, and it sounds counterintuitive, think short and medium term at the moment. Because we've we've all benefited from Rishi's generosity with furlough, and that's still got a little bit of a way to go now. But I think we could, if we get our businesses wrong as we start to come out of this, and we see sales hopefully growing, or top line certainly growing, and we all of a sudden lose sight of our cost base, we're going to see more and more businesses go. So I think the next six, nine, 12 months are going to be so, so sensitive in managing our businesses day to day. And then we are, sadly, we're going to have to, to a degree, react accordingly when we get through it. Excellent, Neil. Thank you very much for that. Now, we are sitting at about 10 to 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work around the group for kind of final thoughts. We have got quite a few subject areas we haven't been able to touch on yet. So I'll just, uh, if it's okay, I'll just give you a topic in terms of subject area. If you can give us a bit a minute on that and then your final thoughts, then that would be brilliant. So Simon, coming back to you and on the um, consumer trend side of things, what you think is going to happen with your crystal ball out and then your uh, final thoughts would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think there are three uh, consumer trends which I think were, you know, were happening pre-COVID, but I think COVID has accelerated them. I think the first one is the digitalization of customer experiences. You know, the, uh, the yeah. smartphone is becoming all powerful and uh, any organizations that don't embrace digitalization and use it as an opportunity rather than a threat, I think are going to come unstuck. You know, it still strikes me as amazing that you know certain pubs don't allow people to use phones in it. It just seems like you're you're fighting against the uh, Titanic there. I think the second piece is probably convenience. Uh, people uh, are, you know, if if you're going to travel a length of time or put yourself out for something, it's got to be absolutely top notch. So either you're delivering something super sensational that people are going to rate above everything else that's there and think much broader than your sector uh, that it's truly a destination product or you've got to think about how can you take your products to the uh, customers and I think Ian's uh, description about pizza pilgrims is exactly doing that you know the minute they've taken their pizza product and taken it to the consumers which I think uh, is a clear winner uh, in my eyes and I think the final bit is just probably simplicity I think the other danger that there can be is we try and overcomplicate things. And the simpler it can be, uh, the easier it is to be adopted. So with everything that we're doing now, it's about simple. How can you do things in the least amount of customer service touch points, the least clicks, the least interactions, and the simpler that you can make everything and the less that there is, the easier it is to make sure that that's really high quality what you do. So, you know, this isn't just about making things simpler and more efficient. It's also about then enabling you to focus on things and give the very best experience that you can. So I think those trends of digitalization, convenience and simplicity have just accelerated, but I think they'll just continue to accelerate going forward. Excellent, Simon. Thank you very much for that. Really, really good insights. Thanks for being with us. Now, coming back on to Jim, um, and along with your final thoughts, Jim, if you could just let us know how, what advice you would give to organizations who are looking to future-proof, I suppose that's a bit of a contradiction in terms, but are looking to um, 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 improve their business standing for the future, and your final thoughts. Um, well, a bit, bit of a, a mix of the two. I think, you know, particularly in these kind of forums, I think we can get quite down about um, not what we perceive consumer spending to be. Um, but, um, you know, this morning I Googled consumer spending stats to remind myself of some of the stats that, that, have, uh, that have been out over the last few weeks. And consumer spending overall is actually fairly flat year on year. 
just under flat. Um, and I think what, what's going on at the moment is that consumers are more do things inside the home focused than they are in normal times. They've been, been sat at home for three or four months and um, uh, staring at the sofa that they want to repair or the re replace or the redecorating they want, want to do or whatever it, it might be. And uh, you know, I'm convinced that that spending will shift back towards hospitality. Um, so you know, we will we we will see uplifts from from where we are, and and to reinforce that, I already speak to lots of people who who have sales of that are fairly comparable to last year, and they're sort of tearing their hair out slightly over the five or ten percent they might be missing missing over against last year's sales, but you know they're still making ninety ninety five sometimes over over a hundred percent of last year's sales in hospitality. Um, and uh, you know, one of, in terms of future proofing, I'm one of the big drivers of that seems to be location based. Um, you know, as, as we touched on briefly earlier, the, the commuter to central London and to some extent, some of the other um, cities um, or to central parts of some of the other cities doesn't seem to be coming back any, any time soon. I'll probably speak to more accountants, lawyers, etc. cetera, uh, than most people. And very few of them have plans to repopulate their offices with with large numbers of people any time that's uh, sufficiently soon that it won't get kicked back. Um, I have a personal theory on it actually for those that are interested, which is um, having lived and commuted in several cities around the world, the ones that seem to be tr struggling are the ones where the bosses have, have an awful commute. Um, and so, so I've lived and worked in Madrid. If I was doing my job, job in uh, Madrid and I lived the 6.9 miles um, that I live from from my office in London, I'd probably get in my car and in about 15 minutes I'd be in the parking garage of the of the block where my office was and, and that'd be that. Whatever I, where I go from Wimbledon to Victoria, it's 45 minutes to an hour and none of them are pleasant. Um, uh, you see the same in New York. Uh, for most uh, bosses, none of, none of the commutes to, to central New York are uh, are things that anyone looks forward to. Um, so I, I can see, you, you know, this um, people using Zoom, etc., to av avoid the, the lengthy commute being something that we, we have to learn to live with. Now, the positive contrast uh, to that, and Kristen, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, is, is the boom that's going on on some of the affluent high streets. Um, you go to uh, the sort of well, Wimbledon, Richmond, uh, the the northern and and and, um, and eastern equivalents of those those places, and restaurants are jammed, pubs are jammed, uh, business, businesses are, are are doing very well. So I think in in terms of positioning yourself for the for the future, my my top tip would be think about where people are going to be spending money. Um, and think about whether you should take the opportunities that uh, the vacancies are going to throw up to reposition your properties uh, to places where there's going to be more money spent than there might have been historically. Absolutely, absolutely, Jim. Thank you very much for that. Great, uh, great thoughts. And um, I think you were basically saying that you need to make public transport much nicer and order for us all to get on it, which I'm all for. So that's uh, I'm, I'm taking that from your, your stance. Thank you. I think that'll take a bit longer than the time it takes to get out of COVID. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably, I agree. Um, and uh, Ian, coming back to you, and just before your final thoughts, I mean, Boris came out on the 1st of August and said everybody's got to get back to work and get back to work in offices. And the government's done this amazing job of basically scaring the crap out of everybody for the past four months in terms of stay at home, stay at home, stay at home. What do you think it's going to take, or what would you do if you were in the government situation to get people back out of the house again? I mean, well, thanks, thanks for that. Well, that was that was that was not what I was expecting to be asked. There we are. <laughs> um, uh, look, I don't know. I mean, I, look, clearly, central London is a catastrophe at the moment. Um, we've got to do something to get people back in, but it is deeply unattractive. We know that. I mean, Jim's absolutely right. Commuting into into London is not much fun. Um, so it's not an easy question to answer. And I'm probably going to duck it completely because that's probably the safest thing to do. Um, what I would say in terms of trying to be more granular about trying to give people some, some thoughts over the next six months, I would say definitely number one and number two and number three 
is look after your cash. We've all got to look after your cash. I mean, you've got to get through this period. You can, you can think about all the nice things, but we've got to make it to, to March when we can probably make some more bold and exciting decisions. Um, I, I, we talked about pilgrims. I think, uh, is there an opportunity to take your business outside the four walls where you may or may not be trading? I think that's a big opportunity. And it's not new. I mean, for goodness sake, if you, those of you who are as old as I am, will remember that Hard Rock sold more t-shirts than burgers at one point. You know, if your brand really connects with people, and we're in a world now where, you know, brands like Google, Amazon, um, Apple have taken an unbelievable hold on their customers. And maybe it's scary, but actually they deserve, they've won it. I mean, they've won it through doing some great, amazing things. And I think maybe on a small, much smaller scale in our sector, maybe there are ways in which we can create really deep loyalty where we will get rewarded for it and we'll end up with more valuable businesses. And I think that's, that's a great target to go for. And it's something rather noble to go for. The other thing I would say is I think in the medium to long term, if you look at most investing that's going on amongst the, you know, the grown ups like BlackRock and people like that, everything comes back to ESG and how you do things and how you think about the world. And I think that's going to get more and more important. If you take that down into our world, particularly in the food and drink world, you know, sourcing, ethical sourcing, all these sort of things. Are you, you know, are you carbon neutral? All these things are going to become more and more important. They're not just a luxury that we thought we'd have in a bull market. So I think there's lots of things to think about. And I think, you know, my personal view is I'm going to spend the next six months going out there, looking at businesses. If anybody wants an old fart coming on, have a look. I'm up for it. I've got, you know, I've got time. I want to do that. I want to go and see what's going on now and how people are reacting to it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ian, and thanks very much for being with us. Much appreciated. Pleasure. Neil, coming on to you, and just for your final thoughts, um, um, I thought I'd come to you with the question about the recovery side of things, because you obviously, you mentioned earlier on that you thought things were going to be financially unstable for, for the next, for, for the rest of this generation. What do you think the recovery looks like, and how long do you think it's going to take with your final thoughts? Um, there are so many forces at play, Krishnan, aren't there? You know, and you, you look at China, you look at presidential elections, you look at COVID, you look at Brexit, you then look at currency impacts, you know, the, the, the reality is, and I read lots of articles from people far, 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 far cleverer than I, whether they've been to Harvard or whatever, and no one is saying the same thing. So, you know, we've got, we've got, to, we've got to ride it out, we've got to control what we can control, which at the moment isn't a huge amount from what we've been used to through our careers. Uh, Cash is king, as Ian says, um, and we, we've we've sort of, to a degree, we we got to keep our heads down. You know, I saw, I saw a comment. I think it was the chief executive Google about going back to work, and I think he said something like, "We're going to watch, wait, and react." Now, you wouldn't expect that from a company like Google that has led the charge, but actually, there is a lot to be said for that, because there is a lot that we don't know. There's a lot that we can't predict. And there is an element of, you know, keeping your shit together, keeping yourselves lean, keeping yourselves nimble and being able to react because it's horribly cliched, but no one has got a crystal ball. But certainly, you know, with my contract catering hat on, where we've been and where we're going is making sure we are not a barrier for businesses wanting to bring their workforce back. Now, everyone will have a view on what that particular area, workforce feeding may look like in 12, 14, 16, 18 months or so. General feeling is that these big London Canary Wharf base offices may become more of a almost a social hub rather than a eight till six, five, six day a week working environment. So therefore, what do we do to predict and be flexible enough and nimble enough to operate in whatever that new space may look like? So, you know, there's lots of things you can do, but I don't think try and boil the ocean is, is the answer to it. It's uh, it's sitting sitting very very tight in the short term would be my view. And, and um, sorry, just to digress a little bit further, Neil. But in terms of the the tech companies that you're involved with, especially the one that's just floated on the New York side of things, can you tell us a little bit about what they do and what lessons perhaps we could learn from them in terms of that? Because I mean, I guess everybody's running towards technology, looking for answers and salvation, right? Oh, it's interesting you say the word answers because the business is uh, is called Yext and I sit on the advisory board of the Northern European uh, business they floated three and a half years or so ago and quite simply it is to make businesses more discoverable and it is based around AI and it sits between search, en search engines and businesses 
and basically the aim of this business is to make sure the company owns the truth about what is being talked about on the web. So if you were to go and Google, and this isn't a pitch for Yex, by the way, oh, well, maybe it is. Uh, if you go and Google how many calories are in a pint of Guinness, you will get a load of blue lines that are paid for. You then probably get a load of bloggers who've got an opinion saying there's 30 calories in it, it's full of iron and you should drink it if you're pregnant. And then you might have another one saying there's 1500 calories in there. Now Diageo, who happens to be a client of ours, are now working with us. So when you Google that, you will get the truth. And the truth is owned by the brand that owns that particular product. So that, that is very simpli simplistic uh, overview, Krishnan, and I'm, uh, I feel, feel like I am giving you a sales pitch now, but it's very, very simple AI based and we build uh, knowledge graphs for our companies that we work with and we make them more discoverable, whether it's by product, location, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm having been sort of hospitality leisure based, I'm, I'm not cynical about tech, I embrace tech, I embrace change. I'm still hugely, hugely positive about the impact people can have in the world of hospitality. I really am, call me old fashioned traditionalist. There's nothing better than a smiling face, although you can't see him because they're having to wear face coverings now. But you know, that will come back. People, we mustn't lose sight of people. Tech is fantastic, embraced in the right way for all the reasons Simon was saying earlier about touch points, customer journey, et cetera, et cetera. You cannot beat the human touch. Excellent. So there's hope for us all, Krishna. I think that is a good that is a good point to finish on, Neil. Thank you, thank you very very much for that. So that concludes our non-exec uh, chairman webinar. I think um, like I've just made a whole page of notes for myself on there. So thanks very much for that, guys. Um, I think there was some really 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 great insight there. Um, now, so um, we have a well-being and mental health webinar that we're going to be doing at five o'clock today, which uh, involves some of our clients from the states and the UK. So if you're around to log in for that, then please do feel free. All the links are on our social media channels. As I mentioned at the start of the webinar, we are going to be carrying on our series up until the end of the year. And next Wednesday, we are looking at Africa, FMCG, fine dining and private members clubs, hotels, and then we've got a special on USA and Canadian leadership. Also next Wednesday, uh, just to top off the day, we are doing a core LGBT special on alternative families as well. And that's next Wednesday at uh, 6 p.m. So if you want to log in for any of those, the details will be sent out in an email either today or tomorrow. And um, the links are all going to be on our social media feeds from the end of the day. But if you um, do want to recommend any speakers to us, or if there's any topics that you would like us to cover as part of this series, then please do let me know. So just to say thanks very much once again to all of the panel for taking part, guys. Thank you all very much for giving up your time. Much appreciated, some good insights there. Only one swear word, which I was quite disappointed about with you guys. There's normally, there's normally more than that that comes up with the, with the non-exec chairman kind of level. But thank you very much for that, Neil. And um, thank you very much, Holly, for um, doing the IT and organizing the guest list for today as well. And we'll see you in the next webinar. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.